So we have a, a great uh, symposium here, how a unique uh, DES platform translate into clinical differentiation with uh, my stand from uh, premise to uh, proven effectiveness. Uh, it's sponsored by uh, my cell technology. I'm Patrick Serres from uh, Rotterdam and uh, Imperial College, and I have with me Elaza Edelman. If other speakers want to join us, you are more than uh, welcome. Uh, it's a small audience, but I have the feeling that uh, we could start something new. So the people who are here may see I was there when the result was presented, like this morning in the uh, plenary session. I think that we are dealing with not another me too, but something different called me stand. Yeah? So um, I have to show a few slides just to launch the story. Just to tell you that uh, we have uh, to know the science behind control illusion, that will be uh, Elaza Edelman. Then we will hear and discuss the late breaking trial data from uh, Robert De Winter. And then we will have two story on uh, uh, case and, and some result about the MIS-10 OCT by Christophe Mileski and Gennaro Sardella. Uh, clearly, it's a very special uh, technology where basically the polymer with the crystal get in contact with the tissue. There is a slow uh, diffusion of the uh, drug, but uh, at a certain point, the tissue is engulfing this crystal, and the tissue became the reservoir of the drug. And you see these uh, small crystal disappearing uh, progressively. So really, the... Uh, um, the crystal is in the tissue and in the reservoir for the tissue. Um, where is the mist stand? You will see that in a minute. So this is just uh, the curve for the uh, competitors, but uh, um, Rob will show you where is the other curve. And this is the kind of uh, pictures that uh, we have seen with OCT on the left-hand side, the my stand. On the right hand side, the science. By accident, I see Taku Asano, which should be the pictures of uh, Chris. And uh, uh, this is the kind of analysis which has been done by the academic team. Uh, obviously, there is some neo intimal heterogeneity uh, when you are dealing with the uh, science compared to the uh, my stand. So, that's uh, certainly something that we are going to study in the near future. So I think it will be a very exciting uh, uh, session, and the first speaker is Elazar. Thank you, Professor Sroyes. As Professor Sroyes said, this is not a another drug-eluting stent. It's not another bioresorbable sense. It's something completely different. What I'm going to do is very quickly take you through the component parts and then take you through in particular what's unique about this. There's a few messages to this presentation. The first is that this was designed from first principles. In other words, everything you're going to see from what I'm showing you on the bench to what we did in animals to what we've seen in the humans follows consistently from what was predicted to be once it was made. It's a stent with a cobalt chromium backbone. It's thin, it's flexible, it's visible, it's trackable, it's accurate. And given that we've spent a large part of today talking about strut thickness, it's a relatively thin strut, 64 microns. Certainly it's not 150 or even 120, but it is very thin. And as you'll see in a moment, Unlike virtually every other drug-eluting system, it retains its drug longer than it retains its polymer. This is particularly important because the other thing we've learned is while the polymer material is essential for the controlled and prolonged release of the drug, it also carries with it the salt that's added to the wound. It is the proverbial element that makes any wound that necessarily occurs, whether we want it to appear or not, that much worse. Now, as Professor Soroy said, 
there are some things which set this product dramatically apart from all others. It contains sirolimus. That's the oldest of the sirolimus analogs we've used. But it's not in its amorphous form. It's in its crystalline form. Now, that distinction is really important. That means it has to be dissolved before it can be diffused away. That means that a compound which doesn't like to take up water will necessarily take up water that much more slowly, and therefore you can control its release in a way which is far more independent and far more controlled than any system that already has its drug in an amorphous form. And it has a polymer material which sticks to itself as well, if not better, as it's sticking to other substances, and therefore it flows. Now, what do I mean by it flows? In this classic strut adherence system, the only way to get a lot of drug from the strut, imagine I'm the strut and I'm coated with polymer, over to the other strut, which imagine is Professor Soroy's and everything in between, is for us to have a large amount of drug on the strut. And everything just diffuses outward. And diffusion is an exponentially decaying process. And that means it has to be really high concentrations around the strut. And so if you look as we did many years ago, you can see that the fibrin is really concentrated right around the strut. But imagine now you had this material, which has very powerful cohesive forces, which means that when we put it in, we can predict that it will move away from the strut. Then it's not so hard, because I'm moving the source of the drug closer to the next strut. And so what you see here is what we saw at 30 days. The polymer material flows, which means that we can embed less drug if we want or more drug if we want in the material, but we don't need to have the drug sitting right around the strut. And as opposed to having this kind of pattern, we have a pattern which is far more homogeneous. Now, what it also means because it's crystalline and because it flows, it means that the amount of drug that comes out doesn't all flow out immediately, and it doesn't all disappear immediately. It comes out in a relatively controlled rate for, in this case, for about 48, 49 days. And that's true whether it's in a single configuration or overlapping configuration. What you see here is the polymer material flows away, but the drug is retained. And the drug's retained because in its form, it's bound by the tissue. In fact, one of the lessons from controlled drug delivery is that there's two phases of binding, two phases of release. The first release is the release from the strut, and then the tissue takes it up. And if you have a lot right around the strut, the tissue can't take up all of it. But if you spread it out, the tissue does a much better job of taking it out and releasing it for a longer period of time. And you, what you can see here is the estimated available sirolimus concentration is far more uniform, not only over the lesion, but over time. And my colleagues at CBSCT, many of whom are sitting here, have invented a technique which allows us for the very first time to actually physically locate the drug and its receptor in time and space. We can immunofluorescently label the drug and its receptor, something you could never do before. And so what you see at 28, essentially one month, 60 days, two months, 90 days, three months, is that over time, whereas the classic drug eluding, strut adhering coating has all of the drug, now we're not talking about fibrin, we're talking about the drug isolated to right around the stent strut. One, th two, and three months, the my stent actually delivers its payload strut distances away. Now, what's equally fascinating is that not only does the my stent provide for drug at distances far away, this is the quantification. This is where we actually measure those signals. And what you see here is the distance from the strut. So anywhere from 0 to 400 microns. And the strut adherent coating is isolated within the first 20 or so microns. 
And my stent delivers it right around the strut as you want and right near the strut as well. Now, what Dr. Rami Tsafriri and others who work with him have shown is not only is this favorable for the distribution of drug, but it's the amount of receptors that are bound. I told you if you have a large amount of drug, you overwhelm the receptors. It's like somebody throwing 50 balls at me. I only have two hands. So I can catch it. But if I have a whole line of hands lined up, I'm going to have a much more uniform distribution. Now, in Professor Soroy's uh, institutions, Erasmus Institute showed through mass spectroscopy that not only is the drug retained for long periods of time, but it's retained without degradation. And a study that was done looking at the release of sirolimus from the putative, from the, not putative, from the, from the original pioneering um, cipher stent and the my stent, you see that the percentage of major degradation of the very same drug is fourfold reduced by all the manipulations that are made. What you're going to hear about are the clinical data. And I'm not going to go through the fact in any great detail that unlike all of these other devices where late loss continues well into the natural history of the device and that it does not with my stent, is I'm going to make this point I made at the beginning. Not only does this behave the way we thought and predicted it would behave, but every time we've looked at it, we've seen consistent findings. So what we see preclinically, what we see with histology, what we see with immunofluorescence, what we see with OCT, what we see with angiography, all tells a consistent story, none of which contradicts itself. So let me then close my time by going back to the original part of the slide. The three component parts are, as Professor Soroy said, not just another Me Too stent. It's dramatically different. The device is L605 cobalt chromium stent. It's thin, it's flexible. And the drug is seromus, but it's put on in a very different way. It's put on in a way which, because it is crystalline and because the polymer material is made to flow, it moves away from the strut so that it occupies much more of the space in the injured portion of the artery. It does so in a way that allows for the release to be controlled independent of the support. So for the very first time of any device that I know and have worked with, we have independent control of all of these features. The device as a arterial strut and stent, the device as a platform for release, and the device as a mean of retaining drug in a homogeneous manner throughout the entire configuration of the artery. It's therefore not surprising uh, that you will hear very favorable very well-controlled, minimally variable clinical data. So with that, I'll close my remarks and principally oblige myself to thank all my colleagues at CBSCT and as well at MyCell Technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elazar, it would be good to say crystal clear. <laughs> um, I think that uh, we have five minutes for discussion, and uh, I'm sure that the audience will ask questions. What I would like to ask you is um, the fact that you don't have these early bursts. Yeah. And I remember the conversation uh, in Uppsala with the competent authority. They were not pleased by the fact that there was not a release who looks like cipher, a release who looks like science. There was something new with no burst in the uh, first day. And the fact that you have that drug at the level of uh, two nanogram for a long time, what is the impact on the endothelium? What, what is your takeaway on that? So first, I find it hard to believe that anyone would want a huge amount of drug to be pouring out during the period of time of maximal initial injury. There are peaks and periods of injury, 
The first is driving this stent, this metal spear, into the wall of the artery. And seemingly the last thing I would want to do is to pour vast amount of drug right into the wound. There's no evidence, in fact, that giving a burst in any data we've ever done, in soul culture, in animal models, even in the preclinical models, is favorable. And in fact, if we go back to many of the early stent, early failed stent systems, they were the ones that released their drug fast and rapidly, be it the initial cipher or, uh, so, I mean, uh, taxes or resolution. So the, the principle is, uh, from that point of view, new. You have a kind of dissociation on the inhibition of the neointima, which is moderate and gentle and long-term, long-lasting, and an endothelium which is able to regrow. Is, is, is so that I'll get the, to the endothelium in a minute. I'm going to intersperse one element as well. I told you that we could also stain for the molecular target of rapamycin. What we see, and what I didn't have time to go through in great detail, is unlike with these strutted here coatings, we get far more drug than there is target for. And so you get a profound imbalance of free drug, which is the toxic part uh, of the drug. And so what happens is that we're balancing not only avoiding giving large amounts of drug, but we're precisely, or, as preci or in a controlled fashion, balancing how much drug for how much target. Now, whether it's endothelium, whether it's pseudoendothelium, whether it's any coverage, what you can now do is allow for a healing process to proceed, yes. as you described, in a yes. far more homogeneous manner. Very good. Any question, I think, it's a very fundamental explanation. We will remember that because uh, if in the long term we get even superior clinical result, we will have to rely on that explanation for the long-term good clinical outcome. I think it's uh, time to see these results. So for Robert, it's a deja vu. It is the second time or the third time because he had the press uh, release this morning. So he could uh, hold the talk uh, even sleeping now, yeah? So these are three, Professor Rob de Winter from uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this symposium. And isn't it interesting that this complex biotechnological design device is, uh, is now uh, evaluated in a clinical setting so we can see whether the promise of this technology translates into clinical benefit. So we have the results of the ZOLF3 study, a randomized comparison of science versus my stent, a novel DES that embeds Cerola's microcrystals in the vessel wall. These are my disclosures. Um, and just to summarize, you've seen um, fin struts, um, bioabsorbable polymer that remains in the vessel for three months, and um, microcrystalline serolimus uh, having an effect on the vessel wall after the, uh, after the coating has disappeared. This is unique and it sets it aside from the other devices that are available. The clinical data that we have so far uh, before Dissolve 3 is Dissolve 1 and 2. Dissolve 1 was the first in man study with the primary endpoint of instant late loss. And as you can see at four months point of Zero, uh, 03 at six month point one, at eight month point oh eight, and at eighteen month point oh eight millimeters, which basically illustrates that there is no neo intimal growth after a period of six months. The Dissolve 2 study was a randomized control study with a two to one randomization comparing the clinical outcome of the Endeavor versus the MICE stent. 184 patients were enrolled at 26 sites, and the primary endpoint again was instant late loss at nine months, and as you can see at the lower end of the slide, uh, the distribution of instant late lumen loss, the mean late loss for my stent was 0.27, and the mean late loss for Endeavor was 0.58. Dr. Lansky and colleagues pr uh, performed a propensity-matched analysis looking at the clinical outcomes of the patients from the Dissolve 1 and 2 study, and compared these to the Zion's uh, stent-treated patients in the ISAR Test 4 study. 
And as you can see on the uh, right-hand uh, part of the slide, if you look at target lesion revascularization at one year, it was 1% for my stent and 6% for Zions. And at three years, the TLR was 2% for the MyStent and 8.4% for Zions. So this is the first indication that the technology translates into a lower rate of TLR at a long term, comparing the MyStent to the Zion stent. So this is a trial organization for the Dissolve 3. The steering committee was chaired by Dr. Sarais. The Data Safety Monitoring Board was chaired by Professor Stephen James. There were four members of the Clinical Endpoint Committee. There was a core lab for OCT and angiography. The sponsor of the study was uh, ECRI, and the sponsors were MyCell Technologies and Stentus. This slide summarizes the participating sites in four countries in Europe, the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Poland. And in blue, you can see the centers and investigators that were involved in the OCT substudy from which you will hear later on during this session. Now, if you look at the uh, enrollment, the uh, three top enrollment enrollers, and I think that we should acknowledge these, uh, are uh, Dr. Lutz uh, from Leipzig, Dr. Bushman from uh, Poland, and Dr. Jesserun from uh, Emmen in the Netherlands. Uh, and all these investigators have done a tremendous job in uh, getting the data together for, uh, for the study. The one-year outcome was finished in December 2016, so we've had a lot of uh, uh, activity going on to get this data um, together for this meeting. The hypothesis was non-inferiority of a device-oriented endpoint, a composite of cardiac death, target vessel myocardial infarction, and clinically indicated target lesion revascularization, comparing the my stand with the Zion stand for 12 months. Sample size calculation, uh, estimated primary endpoint 8.3%, 8 non-inferiority margin 4.0%, a total of 1,400 subjects were to be randomized. These were real-world, all-comer patients. We included all patients, all lesions, very, very few exclusion criteria were applied. We randomized 1,398 patients in a one-to-one -one fashion, 703 patients to the my stent arm and 695 to the Zion stent arm. If you look at baseline characteristics, the age was uh, around 66 years. 70% of the patients were male. There was a sizable proportion of diabetic patients, 27%. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, 40% of the patients had stable angina, and the other patients were treated for unstable angina or acute coronary syndromes. If you look at lesion characteristics, a distribution that can be expected, but there also were patients treated for left main disease, bypass graft, restenotic lesions, and bifurcation lesions. Long lesions were slightly more prevalent, in the MyStem treated group, 56% versus 47% in the Zion's treated group. Procedural characteristics, 30% of the lesions were stented directly. If you look at the number of stents used per lesions, 1.23, uh, there were overlapping stents. The total stent length was 24 millimeters. Now this shows you the primary endpoint. Target lesion failure, in red you see the my stent, and in blue you see the Zion stent. At 12 months, 6.5% versus 5.8%. And this shows that the non-inferiority hypothesis was met with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. If we look at the components of the primary endpoint, cardiac death, 2.0% for my stent versus 1.6% for Zion's. If you look at target vessel myocardial infarctions, 2.2% versus 1.9%, basically no difference, but of course these uh, numbers are very low. And then if we look at clinically indicated target lesion revascularization, which is the endpoint that was predicted to be lower for the my stent compared to the Zion stent, 3.8% for the Zion stent and 2.6% for the my stent. The curves are virtually superimposable on until about six months, and then you can see that they gradually diverge. Of course, again, these numbers, numbers are low, and they're not statistically significant. Why are we really um, accelerated about, about these data? If you look at clinically indicated target vessel PCI in cabbage, I didn't show this slide this morning, this is my stent 3.5% and science 5.0%. This is target vessel revascularization, again, showing a divergence of the curves after six months. And if we look at any repeat PCI or cabbage, 
again in red the my stand, 8.9%, and science 11.4%. So the signal is quite consistent uh, along, uh, among the different endpoints, showing that repeat revascularization is lower with the my stand compared to the science stand, <coughs> as is predicted from the preclinical work. Definite stent thrombosis, very low, 0.4% versus 0.7%. Definite and probable stent thrombosis, 0.7% versus 0.9%. If we look at subgroups, there are subgroups uh, on this forest plot. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read it, but um, if you look at any diabetes, acute coronary syndrome, STEMI patients, if you look at gender renal insufficiency or lesion characteristics such as long lesions, bifurcation lesions, left main lesions treated with bypass, lesions treated, as you can see, there are no differences, there's no interaction between these subgroups. So in conclusion, the mice stand with early elimination of the polymer and sustained release from the microcrystalline serolimus embedded in the vessel wall was non-inferior to science durable polymer of everolimus eluding stent for target lesion failure at 12 months in an all-comer population. There were no statistical differences among the stratified analyses in the subgroup, subgroups and the data support the hypothesis that long-term cytostatic inhibition of early neointima could prevent the late neointimal growths seen at medium and long-term with a conventional drug eluding stent, as was again predicted by the preclinical work. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. We will open the discussion, I think. If I may say something is that uh, there's two ways to look at that trial. One which is cool, it's non-inferiority, non-inferiority has been achieved, that's it. And the other, a little bit more uh, phantasmagoric, saying, did you see that uh, divergence of the curve uh, in the clinically indicated uh, 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 target vessel? And I think that's, uh, that's something interesting because it can be the play of chance, but I had the uh, the chance to talk to one of my friends of the competitors, the science, and he said, well, that's the first time that I see a, a competitor which is below our level. So, I mean, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen in the uh, following uh, month. Uh, because what is amazing is that if you look at the p-value for interaction, nothing emerged but nevertheless, the curve diverged. So it would be very interesting to see uh, in the future these p-value for interaction at two years or three years and see if this uh, divergence is going to disappear, get stable, or increase with time. Very, very exciting uh, prospect. Any comment, any remark? So I would agree. I think it emphasizes something that it's, again, the an undercurrent throughout this. we love to hear your thoughts as well, and that is that the best way to stave off injury is to do no injury at the beginning or to minimize injury. And so the reason presumably we're seeing these late effects is because we're not being so abrupt and violent at the beginning. You comment as a interventionalist uh, to a vascular biologist. Um, what, what comes in mind um, um, in the first place is that because this is a real-world, all-comer population, and I, I, you know, we've treated uh, a sizable number of patients at my institution, these were sometimes long lesions, heavily calcified lesions, where, let's say, some form of aggressiveness actually is needed to, to come to a good result. But uh, I agree with you that if the device is um, not causing a lot of injury because the struts, the struts are, are thin, um, then uh, I think maybe half of the battle is won already. And if you're minimizing the amount of drug, if we're correct, mm -hmm. that pouring high amounts of drug, either for the burst or locally, actually adds another element of injury, perhaps that's what we're seeing later. And this homogeneity I'm eager to see as well. Any question from the audience for Robert? If not, uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Robert, and then we will uh, move to the uh, OCT. And uh, that's uh, Chris Milowski, who has really, uh, in Poland, with basically uh, three colleagues, uh, push and do what was almost uh, 
impossible is to start an uh, OCT study at the very beginning of the trial. They were rushing, but they achieve a wonderful result. Yeah, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation to this session. Uh, on behalf of uh, principal investigators and dissolved three OCT in sub-study investigators, it's my pleasure to present OCT data with some clinical cases. I have no, no conflict of interest. To report some background, conventional drug eluting stance uses short-term drug release of less than 90 days from a durable polymer, which could contribute to late progression of neo thickness hypersensitivity reactions, and neoatherosclerosis with increased risk for late adverse clinical events. In contrast, early elimination of biorosobal polymeric coating and sustained drug release with prolonged retention in the tissue, this is the my stand, have the potential to reduce neointimal proliferation and the risk of late stand failure. So the aim of this SOLV-3 uh, OCT substudy was just to compare at six months follow-up the abluminal instant neointimal hyperplasia volume obstruction, which is a histomorphometric surrogate for neointima after placement of my stand versus the durable polymer coated everolimus eluting science stand. We also wanted to verify in the future whether the effects achieved at six months time point are maintained in the long term it means 24 months OCT follow-up. But before we got going to present uh, the details of the study, it's crucial to understand how we have measured the new intima. As you can see on the picture, the flow disturbance and wall injury are the major determinants of new intima hyperplasia after stent placement. But neointima growth not only on the top of the struts, but also between the struts as a rep response to acute injury and flow disturbance. So histomorphometry, which measures abluminal neointima, as you can show, see on the picture uh, just at the bottom, is the gold standard for the ex vivo drug eluting stand efficacy measurement because it quantifies the um, amount of neointima tissue not only on top of the struts but also between the struts. So the abluminal stand contour on OCT, you can see it on the right side at the bottom, serves as a boundary for the abluminal neointima assessment. So this approach uh, gives us the, the precise tool to evaluate stand efficacy. So now let me briefly show the trial organization with study investigators, with Professor Sirois as a chair of the study, with data management and monitoring, with the OCT and geography core lab, with the institution responsible for statistical analysis, sponsor and the grant givers. And all patients enrolled in the study uh, were uh, enrolled in three clinical uh, centers belonging to American Heart of Poland. So in total, 278 patients were randomized to the SOLVE-3, and for subsequently 25 patients from the Meistern group and 28 patients from the science group signed in firm, informed consent form for the OCT substudy and six-month OCT was performed. We also planned uh, OCT control OCT imaging at 24 months uh, follow-up. And as you can see, the main inclusion criterion related to OCT substudy was one single de novo lesion with stenosis of more than 50% successfully treated with the study stand, and main exclusion criteria included lesions that, in opinion of an investigator, could result in suboptimal uh, imaging or excessive risk of complication from placement of an OCT catheter. By comparing the baseline clinical data, you can see typical patient characteristics for such studies with no significant differences between the mice and treated and the science treated patients. The number of the males was similar, the age was uh, practically identical, the, the frequency of comorbidities like diabetes mellitus, hypertension, renal failure, all these parameters were comparable. Also baseline procedural and QCA data were very comparable between uh, the, groups, the groups, the minimal lumen diameter, person diameter, stenosis, or acute gain, all these parameters were comparable. The study, of course, has some limitation, like each study probably in the world. So first of all, the science stand using the study was longer. This fact could have an impact on neontima volume, 
However, the primary OCT parameter that we have chosen, it means the percent volume obstruction is a normalized parameter that takes into account the stand length, volume, and strut thickness. Secondly, although the current study is sub-study of a randomized trial, the randomization was not stratified for the two respective device subgroups. And finally, the sub-study was not powered to detect differences in clinical outcomes. Now let me present some clinical examples. And here you can see that tight stenosis in proximal LAD just before the septal branch. This is also another view of the same lesion. Here you can see the effect after science stent placement with residual stenosis by, measured by QCA of 16%. And this is the six months follow up, the good uh, um, effect with uh, instant late lumen loss of minus 0.01 millimeter. So this patient was actually enrolled to the uh, dissolve OCT substudy. You can see the imaging which we have performed six months after stent placement. So you can see relatively thin in the intima and all uh, struts are well covered. Here we can see another example. This is the tight lesion subocclusion in uh, CERC with uh, by QCA uh, instant minimal lumen diameter was 0.38. And uh, in the middle, you can see the good results after stent placement, my stent placement. And uh, six months later, the effect was very good with instant late lumen loss of minus 0.15 millimeters. Again, this patient was enrolled uh, to the substudy, and you can see very, very thin neontema with a nice uh, stand up position and with all struts well covered. And this is the last slide showing you the efficacy of the OCT measurements. So at six months follow-up, the mean abluminal neontima area and abluminal neontima volume obstruction was significantly lower in the my stand as compared to the science stand with a strong p-value of 0 0.008. <laughs> so for more details, uh, I invite you to late-breaking clinical trial session, which will held on Thursday. Thank you very much. Very good. So you could uh, scoop before the embargo. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Uh, any question from the uh, audience? I have a question. Yeah. Go away. Hey, um, it's a beautiful study. And um, how should we consider now prior OCT measurements in light of your work? Do you think that um, we might not be comparing like and like, given how careful you were to align them with your appreciation of the neointima from the histopathology? You mean I'm a guy who's coming from preclinical work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I spent mm, a few years working with animals, working with histopathology, and I'm convinced that this method that we have presented here is the best method. Um, the, the only uh, principal uh, rule is that you need to know how to measure the neointima because in metallic stand you don't see uh, the uh, con stand contour, so you need to precisely know what is the strut thickness, and based on this uh, you can have a line, uh, draw the line, which uh, tells you where is the abluminal side of the stand. So I, I perfectly understand, and I right. think it's an incredibly laudable, um, but how should we consider what others have done before you? Have they overestimated? Have they underestimated? Is there a greater variability? You know, as far as you comparing two or three stands, doesn't matter how many stands using the single method, it's far. It's okay, yes? That, that, that now there is the question, what method should we use, the endoluminal or abluminal? I think that it's good to report both these methods. However, just from the clinical point of view, for me, would be to show the total amount of neointima. And this total amount of neointima is measured by abluminal method. Right. I mean, there have been in uh, CCI, I think it's a little bit more than uh, six or seven months ago, a consensus paper about uh, how to measure between biodegradable scaffold, metallic scaffold, 
Uh, and then there's been a consensus that you should report both. And, uh, and clearly in the past, uh, you could find old publication where there was only the endoluminal report, but now there is uh, that consensus. I think what is fascinating here, and I think that I would like to hear the opinion of uh, El Azar, is that uh, you succeed further to reduce the neo intima. And you know, when we do that, we are always afraid of uh, malapposition, uh, 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 poor healing. So I think that it will be interesting here to look at the quality of the endothelium by put probably using blue Evans and looking at scanning electron microscopy if there is a gap of if the endothelial is of high quality. What is your guess? So um, I'll answer that in three parts. I always answer everything in three parts, and I'll answer your part last. So inherent to my question to the two of you was that I saw a profound uh, uniformity around the strut which I don't think you see elsewhere, which makes it far more difficult, I think, to use methods repeatedly to find neointima. The second is that I think when you have malapposition, it's a complex interplay between the geometry, material properties of the stent, and then the tissue reactivity. So uniform neo intima is more likely to anchor all of the struts than a lesion which has heterogeneity where you might have a large buildup in some part of the clock face and nothing elsewhere. And that what will happen is that it will naturally torque the stents and pull them up, assuming that other factors in malapposition don't occur. Now, I saved your question, your specific question for last, Patrick, because I, I have perhaps a, um, a view that what we're not seeing is intact endothelium. Endothelium is a confluent monolayer of endothelial cells whose secretome and genome are of a very specific type. But we are seeing, in all stents, a layering over the top, which serves as a passivating biochemical surface and an impenetrable barrier. And in this regard, I think that the exclusion of Evans blue dye is an admirable thing to do, but the genotyping and secrotyping of the endothelium is not that important, in principle because no atherosclerotic lesion has an intact endothelium. Uh, just, just a short question. Congratulations for the study. Uh, how is important, in your opinion, the stent implantation technique? And if in this study it's allowed any stent implantation technique, it's uh, at operator's discretion in terms of over dilatation, pre dilatation? Or no, it was not uh, required by the protocol. It was uh, upon operator discretion. So uh, while we were gathering all the data, we saw some numerical difference uh, towards more predilatation in the mice stent. However, no p is a significant p value was achieved. So we were assuming that uh, it could be because the the cyan stent is a workhorse stent. So we really trust the stent. We know. Uh, the, the, the negatives and positive sides of the stand, but the, the my stand was new. It could be the place of chance, but it, it could be also the, the matter that we didn't know the my stand, so we wanted to predilate the vessel. But otherwise, all the parameters were absolutely comparable, and I don't think that we really have uh, any potential influence on the results. Very good. I think we should uh, thank you very, thank you much, very much again. Uh, and uh, our last speaker is uh, Gennaro Sardella, which is going to bring back in the uh, field of the practitioner down to earth. How does it work? Thank you, Professor Sirois, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. Uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, before to show you my clinical experience, I uh, would like to start from uh, two important facts that the, the previous speaker 
already focused. The, f the first one is the outstanding acute performance of my stent is allowed by the super thin stent thrust, that is the lower 64 micron, that leading deliverability, that is the best deliverability compared with the other deaths, and thus the super thin stent thrust allow a challenging lesion uh, uh, treatment. And the second one, is the, uh, the thinness struts reduced flow disruption, thus reducing the risk of thrombosis. So you can see that the super thin struts directly allow a rapid strut coverage. This is the first case. It's a 58 years old, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, smoker, and prior stroke with stable angina, a action fraction of 40% with inferolateral hypokinesia and anterior akinesia. <laughs> uh, you can see the left uh, coronary angiogram, the basal angiogram, and the right coronary angiogram. You can see that the Sinta score, very high Sinta score, 52. Uh, it was the um, disease that they occluded the um, left anterior descending, and it was disease that uh, first up to marginal, and very disease, the long diffuse disease of right coronary artery. The patient was refused by surgeon for low, uh, for low ejection fraction and because the LID was closed for previous stroke. And we decided to treat this patient in, um, by a multi-stage procedure. We performed before a procedure, a PCI on uh, right coronary artery. We dilated with a balloon, two balloon, 2.5, 20. The right coronary artery, we implanted two mice stand, three for 30 and 3.5 for 30, 60 millimeter of my stand. And we perform an over dilatation with a non compliant balloon, 3.5 for 15 and uh, 4 for, uh, for 15 in the proximal part of right coronary artery. This was the final result, a very good final result. That it was the OCT with a very good apposition of the stent. Uh, along all the lesion uh, of, the, of the right coronary artery. And uh, this was the, the final result. It's an old segment of the right coronary artery with uh, the OCT, OCT imaging uh, study. And uh, in the second stage, we performed a PCI on the optus marginal. We implanted a three mice stent from uh, distal to proximal part of our first optus marginal, 2.5 or 19, 23, and 23. And it was the final result of this, uh, this vessel. This was a high, uh, eight month RCA OCT imaging. You can see the final result, it was well maintained. And we perform an OCT, and you can see that after eight months, it was a very good endotelization of the uh, old lesion, uh, old segment of the right coronary artery. The second patient, it's a 72 years old patient, hypertension, uh, chronic, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, obesity, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, dilatative cardiomyopathy, 20% of ejection fraction, recent syncope, and the clinical presentation was characterized by dyspnea, a New York class 3 to 3 ventricular tachycardia, and very low ejection fraction. This was the coronary angiography. You can see the um, LAD in, uh, with the lesion in the mid part, and you can see that we had a very big doubt of the proximal part and ostial part of LID, and the right coronary artery was uh, occluded, chronically occluded, and the disease of the uh, le of left circumflex. The CETA scores are 43, having this patient, the patient was, re re was refused by surgeon for the low ejection fraction and obesity. And we performed an uh, IVUS ostial LID investigation because we like to know if this uh, lesion, it was uh, significant or not. We performed an IVUS investigation and we achieved this area, this was 4.8 millimeter, and then we decided to treat the osteal LED in the mid part of LED. We uh, treat this patient as primary strategy with, uh, strategy with a rotablator because this was very calcified lesion with a step-up procedure from 1.25 to 1.75 from the proximal to distal part of the um, proximal to mid part of LAD. 
Then we uh, use a cutting balloon, a balloon non-compliant balloon, two non-compliant balloon to optimize the lesion preparation. And we implanted two stent from uh, mid part to proximal and ostial part of LED to my stent, three for 15 and three for 30. It was the final result, very good final result. It was the final IVUS final control with a very good apposition of the struts. After the discharge of the patient, nine months later, it was onset of exertion angina with inferolateral uh, ischemia. And we, uh, we thought that the, the culprit lesion would be this very short, tight lesion and the first obtuse marginal. We implanted another MyStand, 2.5 or 19 millimeter. It was the final result. But what we performed, the nine-month LID OCT in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, during this uh, procedure, and you can see even in this case, after nine months, a very good reendutilization of the whole segment of the treated LID. In conclusion, the Sirolimus eluding absorbable polymer coronary stent system, my stent, has two distinguished fe features. The unique mechanism of drug delivery and super thin strut design. My stent allows an outstanding acute performance even in complex coronary lesion. This is our clinical experience. After implantation, the imaging control showed the complete stent struts are positioned in our patients with an high rates of stent strut coverage between six and eight months. Thank you for your attention. So uh, Harsler used to say you cannot argue with success, okay? <laughs> so that's it. I mean, it's a great case. And uh, any comment from the audience? If not, we are going to conclude that session by, as requested by the organizer, some uh, take-home message, uh, which... So I uh, learned a lot again from uh, El Azar, and I would like to show again a little bit more in detail this mechanism uh, of action. You have the polymer with the microcrystal of uh, Cirolimus. You get in contact with the tissue. There will be some diffusion uh, to the tissue uh, at the concentration gradient, avoiding a burst of Cirolimus. So if you look in the first days here, we don't have any burst of uh, Cirolimus. Then come the second phase, there is some growth of the neo intima and the microcrystal of Cirolimus is engulfed in the neo intima and will raise the concentration of the Cirolimus, but uh, this is not amorphous Cirolimus, this is microcrystalline, so it, it's a pseudo burst of the drug. And then from these uh, microcrystalline, you will have a further diffusion into the tissue. Uh, that's the unique uh, component. And then you have this uh, phase of prolonged uh, diffusion of the drug at the level of up to uh, two nanograms. So I think that's uh, something which is uh, quite unique because uh, you will have understood that the polymer has gone. And I was uh, fascinated by that slide of uh, El Azar because if you look at 90 days, you have the struts, and then you have this uh, microcrystal of uh, Cirolimus, which is basically uh, 130 micron from the struts. So that's really proving uh, the concept. Chris did the beautiful job. I mean, uh, he did give you uh, one slide of the uh, uh, late-breaking trial, but clearly uh, uh, in the science we see more neo-intima than in the uh, my stand. And then uh, I would like you to draw to attention that this is uh, uh, science, this is the my stand, and then uh, we had this uh, uh, result of uh, uh, of the trial showing uh, the two on the same line, but uh, we are all puzzled by uh, this uh, slight divergence 
in uh, TLR and clinically uh, TLR. And finally, we got this uh, wonderful uh, IVUS uh, result of uh, Gennaro uh, with the reverberation showing that that technology, despite the thin struts, can handle a difficult and robust calcified lesion. So the take home message is that we are dealing with an ultra thin strut. There are not so many around or zero and a few done, which reduce the vessel wall injury and uh, do not disturb the laminar flow uh, as much as uh, a larger stent. There is an early elimination of the polymer, reducing the inflammatory burden. That's very important. There is no early burst of the cytostatic drug, potentially altering the endothelialization. There is a sustained drug release 270 days to prevent the neointimal catch-up and potentially the late TLR. It will be very exciting to witch that. At six months OCT, we have a reduced neointimal volume obstruction and a, a complete stretch coverage and no late acquired malaposition. It is non-inferior to science in all commerce population for all predefined subset of patients, diabetes, acute coronary syndrome, small vessel, multivessel disease, and overlapping. And potentially, we see a diverging Kaplan-Meier curve of clinically indicated TLR, TVR in favor of my stand. Finally, the device is appreciated by the practitioner, low profile and cost and good cost ability. Thank you very much. Yeah.